According to an internal investor memo, grocery delivery startup Instacart had a hot fourth quarter. Revenue increased 50% from a year ago, and gross profit rose more than 80%. For the full year, revenue came in at $2.5 billion. Instacart is also preparing to go public in the next few months. The company filed for an IPO last summer, but ultimately pushed back those plans due to poor market conditions. So, Scott, there was a lot of speculation last year that that the COVID grocery delivery boom wouldn't last. And that was especially reflected in the markets. You had all these rapid delivery companies that were shutting down their operations. Uh, DoorDash stock came down 70% last year. Even Instacart's valuation was cut by around 70%. Um, But these numbers feel like it's delivery's redemption. So do you think this grocery delivery boom is actually going to be here to stay? It does feel as if delivery, grocery delivery, is one of those enduring features of of a post-pandemic world. Um, Between Q1 and Q2 2020, Instacart's revenue grew 157%. And 2020, average quarterly year-on-year sales growth was 236%. But unlike some of the other um, e-commerce growth. It doesn't appear to be a pandemic blip. Um, Instacart hasn't been able to sustain that kind of growth, but it's still um, it's still growing. In Q1 2022, Instacart sales were 4% lower than in Q1 2021, uh, and customers are spending slightly less on each order. So it, it accelerated dramatically, and the sales aren't growing now, but they're holding and total U.S. online grocery sales are forecast to go at a CAGR of 11.7% over the next five years, increasing online share of overall grocery spending from 11% in 2022 to 14% in 2027. I remember thinking that grocery was the last holdout in e-commerce. It was like 2% of grocery was done via e-commerce, and now I think it's accelerated to kind of where the rest of most of retail's categories are. Um, also, you've seen sort of a culling of the herd. A lot of these last mile delivery companies that felt very Cosmo or Web Vanish have gone away, that they were just eating so much capital. Mm-hmm. And these guys feel like, I don't know, you want to call them the Airbnb or the Uber, that space. Um, so this feels like, uh, quite frankly, these guys just feel like, from what I can see, a juggernaut and the ones that have the scale to get to profitability mm-hmm. and to get the best talent and the most capital. So this feels like it could be a watershed or a turning point in the IPO market. Uh, and the IPO market needs something. In 2022, IPO proceeds fell 70% compared to 2021. And in the U.S., IPO deal proceeds declined 94% in 2022 from $156 billion to get this, just $9 billion. In 2019, Uber alone raised $8 billion in its IPO. So this Instacart is not only important for growth, important for um, the IPO market. It could be important for the entire market. The whole world or the whole market is going to be holding its breath if they decide to try and go test the waters of an IPO later this year. Yeah. I mean, some of the data, I mean, we don't have that much data on the entire food delivery market, but if you look at individual company performance, things are going really well. So um, Uber Eats grew its revenue 30% in 2022. It went from 8.4 billion to 11 billion. Um, DoorDash grew its delivery revenue 35% in 2022. Um, and you know, that's compared to insane growth from 2020 to 2021. I mean, both Uber Eats and DoorDash had those revenues either doubled or more than doubled. Um, but it still feels pretty remarkable that you're still seeing some growth in this market when it felt like, I don't know, I, it's, I, I felt at least that I didn't think that I would ever deliver food again um, once I was able to get outside and, and go to restaurants and go to the grocery store. But that, that actually hasn't been the case. Like I still get delivery all the time. Um, has your experience been similar? I haven't been into a grocery store unless it's to buy like alcohol late at night or Advil the morning after uh, the, the alcohol I purchased. I mean, I just don't go into grocery stores. And people talk about, let's, talk, let's look at this. Let's look at the EV market and let's yeah. look at home delivery of grocery. And I think what people are missing is that it's, it's essentially being driven by how bad the channel is. What do I mean by that? The only reason I'm going to buy an EV, I don't like the feel of an EV. I love the throaty, macho feel of an internal combustion engine. I just, 
makes me feel strong like ball when I put the hammer down in an internal combustion engine. I just like it. But the reason I will get an EV is one, I like to think that I'm somewhat socially conscious, although that's not, not really leading it. But the number one reason is the worst retail experience in America is gas stations. Mm. <laughs> I've always thought, this is where I get shot. I don't know where I am, but I pull into a gas station. It's got the shittiest food, the worst retail. <laughs> the thing doesn't work. It smells like carcinogen seeping into your body from everywhere. And it's just a terrible experience. And so the not, I mean, the really the liberating moment when you have an EV, the like the aha discovery moment is when you realize you haven't been to a gas station in six months and you, even, and you never need to go back. I mean, mm -hmm. it's literally freeing. You know, if you think, okay, it takes you 15 minutes to go in, get your gas, pay, and you go into a gas station once a week, I mean, you're talking, you're talking about 12 hours of an awful experience a year. <laughs> and then what's the second worst retail in America? Grocery stores. The majority of America does not shop at Whole Foods. Go into the majority of grocery stores and spin you around. And I call it the 1980s desk. Go to the center of the store, put a blindfold on, spin someone around, take the blindfold off, and ask them how long would it take for them to know they're not in 1980. Mm. <laughs> same stupid cereal brand, same depressed workforce wearing stupid vests with a bunch of pins on them, same bad lighting, same, same cart that has a wheel that takes you off to the left. It's just... <laughs> the grocery stores have literally, in my view, for the most part, not innovated, and they are difficult, hard to park at. I never need to walk into a grocery store again. And so I think this is a category that will endure. And home delivery of grocery just makes, it just makes a ton of sense. I think it's here to stay. Mm. And then you were mentioning the IPO market. So yeah, it's, it basically just died in 2021. There were 181 IPOs compared to over a thousand um, in 2021. Um, we've had so far in 2023, there have been 23 IPOs. That's not many at all. And none of them have been very large or at least large consumer facing companies. And Instacart seems like it is that sort of consumer well-known brand. Do you think that that has an effect on the fact that it's such a consumer facing company will have an effect on its ability to sort of revive the IPO market. Does that matter at all? Yeah, because we relate to these companies that we touch and feel. Consumer brands do get outsized press and media attention. Yeah. Um, so this is, but yeah, the IPO market, I mean, we've just had to digest so much shit. Anything that had a pulse got public and anything that didn't, that even didn't have a pulse got public. Mm -hmm. And the market is trying to churn through those losses. And then finally, when it gets off its heels and onto its toes again, and the IPO market opens up, which I think is going to happen in Q3 or Q4 of this year, you know, the companies that this time survive the culling are going to be really strong companies. Mm -hmm. So the market uh, got way out over its skis, let a bunch of just ridiculously lame and uncool companies into the <laughs> club called the public markets. And then the whole place caught on fire and we're just trying to repair it figure it out but there's a line outside and slowly but surely i don't know where i'm going with this metaphor the, there's going to be some good companies that deserve to be public and the interesting thing about the markets is what you have to realize and it should give you humility as an investor is that uh the market will is that market dynamics will always trump individual performance you can be a shitty company and get public in a great market you can be a great company that can't get public in a bad market Market dynamics always trump individual performance. So there are some really good companies lining up here. There's this one, a Panera, a company I was on the board of is a great company that's growing, really strong margins. They're kind of at the starting gate thinking about an IPO, but now mm. it's up to the market. The ball's out of everyone's hands. It's really when um, the market says, okay, there's institutional investor appetite for a new name. Wasn't, didn't Panera used to be public? Am I getting that? Right. Yeah, they did. And then they were taken private and then they merged with Einstein and um, Caribou. Is it Caribou? No, it's not Caribou. I got to get that. Oh, Caribou Caviar. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was taken private by a company out of Germany that's uh, really, by a really well run company called JAB. And they've uh, wound it up or they purchased Einstein Brothers Bagels and also Caribou Coffee. Uh, mm. But Panera is the. I don't know. I would argue sort of the crown jewel. Anyways. Uh, so what, is that, what does that look like? I mean, you're on the board of Panera. What does it look like from 
a board member's perspective when you're preparing to go public? Are you just sort of kind of twiddling your thumbs and waiting for there to be interest? Or are you actively seeking uh, capital from institutional investors? Uh, how do, What does that f- look like from your perspective when you're about to go public, you're ready to go, but you're just waiting for the tide to turn? Well, it depends what kind of company it is. In the case of Panera, there's not a lot to be done, and it's fine. The company is cash flow positive, EBITDA positive, and it's just, you know, it's just a great company. The market will come. Don't worry about it. Just continue to grow, continue to innovate. So it really doesn't Mm -hmm. impact the company much other than the CEO and maybe the board hear from their bankers. You know, the CEO probably hears from them every couple months and the board hears from them every six months just to get, you know, kind of a market update. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, when it comes like that, it's profitable, it's growing. It's just keep your head down, keep executing, and the market will take care of itself and you'll know when and your bankers will tell you when it's time to go public. Mm -hmm. In the case of a company that's growing fast, but is eating cash, is cash flow negative, it changes. You have to go raise more money in the private markets. So that, that is a little bit more you know, that's more, okay, we have to raise money. At the end of the day, an IPO should be a fundraising event or a liquidity event for existing shareholders, but also as a means of raising capital. Right. And when you're a company that was planning to go public and the market closes, all of a sudden you're caught, okay, we have to go raise more money. And a lot of these companies, including Instacart, that eat cash, had to go raise money at lower valuations. That's fine. Um, And then when the market opens up, the bankers will come and say, this is the type of company that we think the markets would love. And everyone will hold their breath on the first few that go out to see how the market responds. And that'll set the tone for the rest of the year. So it's kind of, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, and this could be that company. Um, right. This company's numbers are strong enough. It has, a, it has enough awareness that it could kind of set the tone for the market for a couple months. This will be an important IPO or non-IPO. And just to find, I don't know if you can speak on this, but why why does Panera want to go to go public? If if you're already cash flow positive, EBITDA positive, the the business is fine. And as you said, an IPO is ultimately it's a fundraising event to go and do something else. Why is Panera? Why does Panera care? Well, capital is a great thing. You can grow your the number of doors. You could go acquire other brands, mm-hmm. but also investors want liquidity. Yeah. Um, typically, the public markets will pay a greater multiple than you can get in the private markets. There's a private to public bump. So the existing shareholders, including the employees, can sell their shares right now in the private market. And the owner makes a market in those shares. But if mm-hmm. it's trading at, call it 8 to 10 times EBITDA, typically the public markets will give it a 10 to 12 times EBITDA because of the liquidity of those shares, mm-hmm. because of the regulatory scrutiny that's been applied. So you have more uh, certainty of what you're mm-hmm. buying. So there, there's a premium to be paid and to be registered with public stock. Mm-hmm. So over time, most companies decide that the way to continue, the most efficient way to continue financing their capital needs and also to reward current investors is to create liquidity mm-hmm. and a certain level of trust and certainty around a publicly traded stock that has certain regulatory requirements. And therefore, most companies decide at the end of the day that the best way to uh, get liquidity and finance future growth is with an IPO. 